gentlemen. This is what I like to see, a theater full of people. How great does it feel to be back in a theater, in an IMAX theater, to see a movie like Dune? Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> so Dune is nominated for 10 Academy Awards. That's 10. So it is nominated, among others, it is nominated for Best Picture, Best Cinematography, and Best Adapted Screenplay. My name is Scott Nance. Uh, it is my honor to moderate today's conversation. Please welcome to the stage, we have Academy Award nominated cinematographer, Greg Frazier. <laughs> Producer, Mary Parent. Director, co-writer, and producer, Denis Villeneuve. <laughs> well, congratulations uh, to all of you. I mean, 10 Oscar nominations after a very successful theatrical run. You build it, and they came. <laughs> so, Denis, the first question is, I know that you are a big fan of the book. You love the book. Like, the book made you say, I got this. What do you mean? <laughs> in, in terms of just like, I, I know how to make this movie. I know oh, what this movie okay. is, is yeah. going to be. Okay, okay. Man, first of all, I want to start to, to, to say uh, by saying thank you so much for having taken the time to come to watch the movie in a theater today. It means the world, the world to us. Thank you. Because uh, uh, as I hope you experience, it, 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 uh, it has been designed be seen uh, on such a screen. In fact, Greg Fraser and I and Mary, we we what we did uh, we saw our first camera test here in this room. Uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, that's that's where we decide how we will approach this movie, which 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 with format, with kind of which which kind of camera, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which kind of lenses. It's, it's a, it has been the one of the first step of the filmmaking process was here. And, and the, one of the last steps of the, the movie was also made here when we finalized the, the, the DI and everything, everything. Uh, I will say that uh, it's a project that uh, has, I mean, uh, that has been uh, cooking for 40 years. So when you ask me how, how I did uh, it, I think that uh, um, what was the strength of this project and what was uh, singular to me to this experience was that it was always the love that I had, that very visceral reading that I, I, I did when I was 13 years old. And I always related to those, the, the emotion, the impact of the book when I was 13 years old. So as Anne Zimmer said, that, that as I said, he said, we made this movie like teenagers, yeah. Do you still have the copy of the book that you read when you were 13? I did, uh, yeah, I do actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> it, it, it came with me to, in the desert all the way through as a uh -huh. talisman, you know, like a, a kind of a Bible. <laughs> so Mary, the first conversations that you had with Denis about this, like what made you say this is our guy? I have so much faith that we have the right director for this movie. First of all, he's one of the best filmmakers working, so there was There's that. that. <laughs> <laughs> Very generous. Um, <laughs> he's very humble. Uh, the second thing was, you know, this film works or has to work on so many different levels. On one hand, it's a very intimate, almost Shakespearean family drama. And then on the other hand, it's this giant, massive, epic, cinematic, you know, undertaking. And so to me is one of the few filmmakers that can do both. So, so Greg, this is your first movie with Denis Villeneuve. Yeah. So how? Quite, a, how, quite, a, quite an uh, important one as well. So, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> so tell me about those first conversations that you that you had, and especially because, unlike Denis, who's diehard fanboy with the book, your 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 appreciation was a little, was a little different. Well, I hadn't read the book, so I didn't know I needed basically the story. Um, but but effectively, what I did is I just let Denis speak. You can hear from his conversation now the passion that he has, and he's really, really able to tap into that fourteen-year-old teenager feeling. That, that, um, and so emotionally, he was being very clear about 
how the film was going to be, how it was going to feel, and I just let him speak. I wanted to, to this film, my experience of this film to be through Denise's eyes, and not through my own perception of what I took on as a, having read the book, so I didn't read the book. Like, did, did not being like super into the book actually present its own advantages? Well, yeah, because I could fo I could hone and focus. I wasn't fighting. Like, as a cinematographer, or as an image maker, you're constantly fighting images around the, in your brain. Like, it's you drive down the street, there are billboards. You know, you're constantly fighting things uh, to to not make a film with, but tools and lenses and. So I really tried to focus on what our film was and what Denis wanted our film to be. So I tried to close all the doors in my brain, image-wise, to what this film wasn't. So that allowed us to kind of focus and hone in on what this film is. So, so one of the things I, I love about the film, I mean, and there's a lot. So, you know, when you're watching a movie that is done on green screen and with, with uh, computer-generated effects and so on, I mean, it's all great, right? but you can see that it's very different than when you were using sets and you were using models and you're using just practical filmmaking. How strong was your mantra, Diddy, to keep it real? It's, it's, um, I have to give a lot of credit to, to Mary here because the, the idea is that uh, I'm old fashioned and you know, I love, uh, I think that as a filmmaker, maybe because I'm coming from that, the, the documentary, uh, inspired by the, by life, but what I can see in front of the camera, and, and I have difficulty to work in virtual environments, and um, so it's like we didn't invent nothing. I mean, we just did the movie <laughs> as they used to be. But now it would be a lie to say that there's no visual visual effects in the movie. <laughs> but we didn't we didn't found for us. If I can reassure you, it's it's like uh, the. No, there's a tons of VFX, but it's true that we tried to build as much as possible to uh, so to inspire Greg to 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 to, to ease uh, our work with the light and, and most more specifically for actors because it's it's not the same when you put someone in a green room or you, you, there's a real set a real environment like it. So so Mary, because because there was such a uh, a push to make it so so grounded and so real, so. When it came to all the crafts, like whether it's production design, hair, makeup, wardrobe, but also sound and editing, like how early on did you did it really feel like you had all hands on deck from all the crafts and not just, you know, certain people came on later? Pretty early. Many of the people Denis had, you know, were frequent collaborators and obviously there were some, you know, new partnerships like with Greg and Jackie, but and he knew who his team was going to be, and he brought them early. So, so right when you were, were, you know, prepping with the knee, I uh, like what kind of cameras did you, were your favorite cameras to use? Well, what was good about this is we we had ideas about what this film might be technically, because you know there is that that thing when you make a movie, it's all good and well to talk about ideas and concepts and you know, but then you've got to make it happen. It's got to, you've actually got to physically shoot it somehow. So we thought we knew what we wanted. We thought we knew how we were going to do it. We thought we knew, based on our, our, our experience, separated from each other, what we were going to do together. And we tested film, we tested digital, we tested Alexa, and, and we thought we knew what the solution was until we sat in that chair, probably, and we all went, oh, this is interesting. This is not what we expected. This is not what we want to do. Yeah, we were, we were thinking, try me, jump in. Uh, it, it, it. We were, I, I, I was thinking going to 35 millimeter. I was like, for me, I was going back to 35, and, and I knew that uh, Greg is not, a, you're, you're not dogmatic uh, cinematographer, you are open to, uh, uh, you have, uh, to everything, to, and, and, but we sat here, and we both, we, the three of us, in mm -hmm. fact, felt that the, 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 it would be Alexa and that the large, large format camera that will allow us to, to capture the movie that I wanted to do, and also to, to go in very difficult and harsh transition, low light conditions, and to go in the desert, because it, it felt very cinematic, profound, and not nostalgic. That's why that I, I felt it in a, a, it was a big surprise for me that we didn't choose 35. I didn't it, choose it, it. it surprised me as well, because we had the opportunity to do that, and one would think, well, we, we could do whatever we wanted to, I mean, in, in theory. <laughs> but, but, but actually, the camera at that point had gotten 
they could learn something from that had gotten good enough that it was it was able to be shooting this movie. You know, like obviously we would never make a compromise on on the portal used to record these performances in this movie. Like this, it's really important to to to, to make that a, a very important part of the, the puzzle. But yeah, it was a it was a great opportunity and great solution. And again, we sat here and looked at it this big, and that's where we went. Wow, that's where you start to go. Okay, that's the format we're going to do. Yeah, and that felt like a new territory. And it, it was there was something exciting, and it felt like the movie I had in my mind. It was fascinating. Obviously, uh, I dream in digital when I was 13. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the, 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 the four three format. <laughs> so so you know, Mary, when when you're working with actors and they're they're doing a lot of uh, filmmaking where there where there is a lot of green screen, but then when they get to go on a big huge set and they get to go on location and they're in the desert. I mean, doesn't that just bring out so much more out of their performances? I mean, that's a Denny thing, but yeah, I think it absolutely does, and I guess Greg could comment on whether that made your life easier or harder. <laughs> I'm not sure, because it depended on the day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once you deal with real light and, and real sets, yeah, you, you've got to get sand in every bit that you have. So um, you could say in some regards it was harder, but I think ultimately, again, just going back to the, the fact that if something's real, as real as possible, then it kind of, it, it automatically has a truth to it, you know, visually. Sure. And, you know, I think that then translates to the screen. And yes, again, Denis can answer more about, but acting performances, and, but I'm, I'm positive that, that, that every human that stands in the wind, in the sand, in the middle of the desert, gets something from that. So we, it would have not been possible to do the movie we've made in, in the, on stage or on the back lot. I mean, there's tons of shots of that we made that uh, were like uh, in, in, in either inspired or possible because of the, of the scope of where we shot. And, uh, when it comes to the scope of the film and the scope in which it was made, it's very tricky to make sure that that scope doesn't overwhelm the emotion. And I think that, I certainly absolutely think that the emotion absolutely shines above all else when it comes to the crafts. How, how much did you try? How, how challenging was it for you to make sure that when you were writing the screenplay with John and Eric that you made sure, look, the play's the thing. You gotta have the, the character, you gotta have the emotion. That cannot be overwhelmed. Yeah, that's uh, maybe the first thing that Mary and I talked about. I mean, that it would be, uh, uh, the movie would focus on that boy, on that 3 Ds, and, and uh, for me it was important that it, it focused on Paul and his relationship with his, his mother. And his father is a very intimate journey. The, 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 the way we made this adaptation was through intimacy. I mean, you can adapt this book in very different ways. So there's a book about geopolitics, about, about the environment, about climate change, about uh, uh, um, uh, the impact of, uh, of colonialism. There's like, but at the end of the day, it's also a very intimate journey. And I focused on that and I made sure that uh, the, the way we, we wrote the screenplay and uh, my job, I was paid as a director to make sure that we would protect this intimacy and set. Uh, yeah, Mary, after films like Noah and Revenant, which were, without question, enormously challenging movies to produce, what made this different? What were the unique producing challenges that you faced on Dune? They're all different. I wish, you know, if there was a formula for each one, but I think, I think the most difficult part was the adaptation. That was a really, really difficult process because the book is amazing, but it's so complex, and there's so many different layers. And then I think we were fortunate to have, you know, incredible people like Greg and Jackie and Patrice. Patrice and Denis have, have like a mind meld because they had worked together. But Denis had such a clear vision. The easiest films to produce, in my opinion, are when you have a filmmaker that has such a precise vision, because then it's it's a lot easier to you know sort of fall in line with how best to support that and problem solve around that. And Denis knew exactly the movie he wanted to make. Well, at the same time, you would experiment at times, you know. But I think you had the ability to do that because you were so prepared, you know. Timmy used to talk about, and I think it's right, how despite the size of the film, it almost felt like an independent film. We, we had the gut of cinema with us. I mean, when we when landed in Jordan, we, we, we spent weeks there, and we had the perfect weather. 
Well, I learned by the fact that there was strong winds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was like always on the verge of a sandstorm, and we were so dejected. And that's, I gave a little tribute to, to Greg and his team, because they, uh, you guys are not that. Going back to the whole independent film thing, that's what's was really interesting about this and what I personally as a cinematographer always try and find when I'm on set because ultimately whatever's behind you, whoever's behind you, it could be thousands of people making the shot happen but ultimately it doesn't matter. If there's a camera there and there's an actor there and there's, if those two don't work together, you know, along with the, with the script and what they're saying. So the, that intimacy is really important. And that was what I, we were hopefully trying to achieve on every setup, to achieve an intimacy. Even on some of the bigger stuff where people are running and there's wind machines and there's water boxes being craned into position. Like, mm -hmm. it, it is ridiculous how big it is when I'm sitting here saying how, how small it was. But that ultimately, you're talking about the character scale and a, a camera and a character playing a little dance. You guys yep. did an interesting thing and you didn't talk about that, but you did at the film art which added a whole other layer of sort of emotion. Yeah. yeah. How did making films like uh, Rogue One, Star Wars Rogue One, and like Zero Dark Thirty, which had some desert locations, prepare you? And how did they not prepare you? Well, I've got the best crew in the world. So ultimately, I just have to turn up. And I have to just, you know, turn up and <laughs> yeah. have, having slept. So my crew are the ones that have to deal with the sand and all the bits and the you know, all that stuff. So um, it, it prepared me because I think it prepared uh, my crew technically and me technically. So when we went to the desert, we knew what we had to do to prepare ourselves to make it look as easy as possible so that there was no technical stuff going on to, to, to stop the, the, um, the relationship between Denis and the actors. You know, that would have been, had anything broken, that again would have been terrible because then that stops Production. So to, to give the and the actors as much time with performance and to, to cover it as possible. So it gave us definitely gave us some some yeah. yeah it, it's true what Greg is saying that is a, it was a beautiful crew. The level of discipline and commitment and uh, it was really uh, they were Navy seals. I mean because I, I, we brought them in very remote areas in the desert with harsh condition and the, the, there was always like the level of enthusiasm and, and energy was uh, really touched me. You know, when you see people, uh, because it's, a, uh, of course, it's a difficult environment to work with, but it's so rewarding for the camera, you know. We were also very fortunate, well, I don't know if it was fortune or, or good casting, but we had a great cast that were also very lovely humans. Yeah. So, despite the fact that they're incredible performance... That was pure luck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you had these actors that were trying to do their thing. I don't know how actors do it in the first place, let alone in the middle of a windstorm you know, miles away from anywhere. So I think that that combination was just a, such a joy to, from a personal level actually as well. Now, Mayor, how, how early on in the development process with the need did you, did you say, we, we, gotta, we gotta divide this, we gotta do this in two parts, do it just. Cousin Mike Hall was his and he said it day, basically day one. And he was, I was thankful that he said it because it was overwhelming to think about not doing that? I think it came from uh, first uh, brainstorm with Eric Roth, when I wake up in one morning and said that it won't happen in one movie. And I, I shared the idea with Mary, and you spontaneously said, you're, you're right. She, there was no discussion. I was just like, we both agreed spontaneously. It hadn't occurred to me that it seemed so obvious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, Greg, I asked, like, you know, when you had, what, what the, the great thing for sure about having, you know, the big, big sets and being on location and the realism at all is, is that it's just it's just so much better but it's also got to be when you're filming like wide shots and some of the big sound stages it's got to be like a nightmare to set up uh what was that like <laughs> yeah i mean unfortunately you know physics is a thing and the sun works a certain way and the, the film business has worked for the last hundred years to to try and replicate real things mm -hmm. and it's never quite right so yeah, we, we, we knew that, that we had to be very honest with the lighting. I mean, I, you know, I think we knew it as a group, but, all, but, but particularly um, as the person who had to make that happen technically, um, I had to, 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 to 
fight, and when I say fight, it's not a real fight, it's more about just being, you know, dogged. You just want to be like, no, this is the way it's got to be, and that's not often normal. Like, often you would build sets inside, we build sets outside. You know, we build sets to harness the real sun, um, you know, which required a commitment from production, it required a commitment from Denis, knowing that the sun moves. We could be shooting on stage, and we had the same light for 10 hours, but in this case, we'd have a certain window to get certain shots, and. You know, it was a little bit like a, um, a rehearsed kind of theatre show at times. We're going, okay, so we know that between 10.53 and 11.03, we can do that shot from 11.04 to, you know, it was as stringent as that because the sun doesn't stop moving. And when we shot inside, I remember the moment when we walked in front of the biggest set and I was super uh, moved and excited, uh, excited because Patrice had designed, it was huge, like a temple. So the feeling when you enter a cathedral, and everybody with a jaw drop, but Greg walked and said, now I have to lift that thing. <laughs> because it's like, it was so huge and, and there was not a lot of space because the set was taking the whole stage and it was for you a real technical challenge to try to bring some naturalism to it. Because yeah. I insisted that I wanted the movie to look as uh, naturalistic, uh, nat naturalistic sorry, as possible. Well, invariably it always happens because you never get a stage that's big enough. Because that's just life, it doesn't matter what the film is, it's, you never have a stage big enough. You never have quite enough, and then everybody builds the sets right to the edge of what they can do, and then it's, it's always like this little struggle. Thankfully, we've got a fantastic group of collaborators that kind of understood each other's struggles. So between Paul, our VFX suit, who was fully into the whole idea of um, natural light and having it feel real, was help supporting painting things out that ordinarily we might not have to, or Patrice, you know, built it a certain way. So together as a group, again, this comes down to kind of Great production supporting that. Great director knowing that you're doing things for a certain reason and it might take away certain options, certain angles, but therefore, so yeah, it was all very, very collaborative. A fantastic process. Yeah, Denis, these last few movies that you've directed in 2013, Prisoners, this phenomenal movie. I mean, really, if you haven't seen it, it's probably on HBO Max. Watch it, it's, it's awesome. It's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> and also, of course, on Arrival, amazing, right? Arrival is amazing. And, and folks, you know, Blade Runner is like my favorite movie of all time. I did not think they could make a movie that was even as good as that, and he did. So, Denis, my question is, how do you go from Prisoners to Arrival to Blade Runner to Dune and your, your progression, and how, what were the unique directing challenges on this that you, you were different from Blade Runner 2049. No, but the, 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 um, it's, I'm always, uh, seriously, the, I don't have a plan, a career plan, but it's always <laughs> choosing projects that I know that I can technically uh, uh, honor. And I would have never ap approached, uh, uh, enter Mary's uh, uh, office 10 years ago. I mean, no, I knew that. I, I, it's just that cinema is a learning process. Every movie you learn, okay? And, and I just felt that I, I was really, as I was doing Blade Runner, I, I knew that I had finally enough knowledge about world building, about VFX, about, uh, um, yeah, to, 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 to tackle something like the size of Dune. Now, the, the difference between Dune, Dune and, and Blade Runner, um, on Blade Runner, the big difficulty was to walk into the footsteps of a giant, and which, to, to try to honor what Ridley had done, which was a big goof. Blade Runner is probably one of my top second or one favorite movie of all time. I deeply love Blade Runner, the original. And to, to, so it was like just to try to honor the giant. Uh, um, but the universe had been built by, had, had been dreamed by somebody else. Now I was referring to the dream of a teenager that I had been myself to try to uh, uh, not disappoint myself was the big challenge with you, <laughs> because uh, that's the thing. The fir one of the first human beings I talked to uh, after uh, uh, Mary and I had met was uh, Hans Zimmer. Hans had read the book two, at 14 years old, and it was one of his biggest dreams to score this movie. I can say that because he said that publicly the last time. And uh, I remember we had a dinner together, and he, he looked me in the eyes, and he said, it is big. It's a German accent, so is it a good idea to do our oldest dream? It's difficult because you know that you are, the chances that you, are you will disappoint 
yourself are very unique in that. So that's what's one of the big difference. Um, and uh, I would say that here the challenges were that the technically was by far the most difficult film that I was uh, attempting to do. Um, one of the big difference, of course, is that we went into real location. The runner was mostly shot entirely on stage. This one was a, a big part of it was shot uh, uh, in, on location. In wow, wow, wow. Uh, Greg, I want to ask about your collaboration with the VFX supervisor and your production designer. Well, Paul, VFX supervisor, is incredibly, like, he's very much light centric. Like, often what would happen is you're sitting around a table to discuss, I mean, we're all filmmakers in here, so we know, like, okay, how do we achieve X, Y, and Z? And everybody has an idea about what they want. Someone might want to do it on stage because it's the only stage available in that window because that's what the schedule says. Someone might want to do it a certain different way technically. Um, Paul would always be the first one when there was an idea that didn't quite honor the light. He would always be the first one that goes, but about the light? And I, I just want to give him a hug every single time. Because <laughs> normally that's my job. Because I'm normally the, the, a, the a-hole really that sits there and goes, no, I can't do that because the light won't work. But he actually was doing that a lot. So, you know, I slipped him a few, a few Hungarian florets every, every time he <laughs> Yeah, I would say that uh, if I mean, uh, uh, Paul, the VFX supervisor, and I had uh, been to the Roger Deakin School, <laughs> where we did Blade Runner together, and, and, and spending a year working with, with Roger, teaching us. I'm not, I, I'm, I will talk for myself, but I'm sure that Paul learned a lot spending a year listening to Roger how to approach light, and, and uh, that's the truth. I should slip Roger a few <laughs> <laughs> but, but the other thing too, again going back to that with, uh, with, with Patrice as well, you know, Patrice's concepts on this were, were, were incredible. They were the best concepts I'd ever seen in my entire life. They were so full, fully realised, even from a lighting perspective. Again, so that placed the bar quite high. So I knew that I couldn't walk past that amazing artwork and then look at my image and go, oh, my, art, my image is not as good as his image. It was a bit of a, it wasn't a competition, of course, but I, it was just keeping the standard high. And, you know, Paul, Paul and Patrice were there very early on as well, and we, we looked at the, the, the process of, of filming out. So one of the things with the format is we, we chose the LF to shoot in IMAX. But then we tested a few concepts of uh, putting it out to film, which I tested a little bit before on previous jobs, but no, never really appropriate. So hearing Denise speak here about what he loved about the LF and what he didn't love about the LF, because it wasn't all perfect. We had to configure lenses, there were some things we changed. Sure, sure. But then we tested the idea of filming out to film uh, to, to help give back. And some people, I had this debate with people, someone's actually come up to me in party and said, you should just use live grain. There is a program that you can use to put grain on. I was like, you missed the point. Unless you've actually done that test and seen the difference between a sunset and um, on film and digital, you know the difference. It's, it's absolutely obvious what the difference is. So um, it's, not a, it's not a digital thing, it's not a grain thing, it's not a texture thing, it's, a, it's, a, it's something substantive about the film, which gave the, our, our film something extra. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very humble, because I would say that the, the, the artwork, it's true that the artwork was, uh, uh, I brought it uh, uh, with the artist at the beginning, uh, something about the light, the quality of the light that I was looking for that would look very mundane, very like a kind of everyday light uh, and, and something very naturalistic. And it, all the artwork that Patrice did after was so ambitious. It was so difficult to do. And, and you always like try it, it as like, a, I was always amazed to see how you achieve that. I mean, it was so I went to my office and, uh, and cried. <laughs> uh, I was confident. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> went to my office and cried, got on the phone to my gaffer and said, how the hell did we do this? <laughs> so then, I, I, you know, I was, I was, I was a good actor. Maybe I'm a better actor than I actually did. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, since we're in the David Keeley Theatre, it seems only appropriate that David Keeley, who is joining us today, uh, ask a question. So, David, come on, come on. Denny and Greg did an amazing job, and I've been in this business a long time, 
And the, the master of this is called the DI, Digital Intermediate. And it was shot in the aerial F. It only has 4,400 pixels across. And I, never, I thought I'd never say this, but I think this DI is probably, is the finest DI I've ever seen. And it rivals capturing in 1570 film. I didn't think I'd ever say this, because it's my 50th year in this business. Wow. And I've seen a lot of DI. So I want to want to ask Greg uh, something I've been interested in. So this is a 143 screen, and the aerial F is a 143 sensor, because we love the height in IMAX theaters like in City Walk and about 50 theaters around the world. When you shot the, the, the scope, did you crop it or did you use anamorphic lenses? We used, uh, uh, we used um, Panavision Ultra Vista 1.65 times anamorphic. Uh -huh. So to basically utilize the entire... Using the entire chip. Yeah. Use the entire chip. But that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And of course, when you want 143, you use the, the whole chip with the spherical lens. Correct. In other words, the round lens. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we realized that um, me megapixels and resolution and all that can be a little bit of a buzzword, and, and some people throw them around as being, as, as being the holy grail. Like, what's the, you know, what's the size of the sensor or what's the, the megapixels? Um, we try to utilize every single, every single pixel for every single frame. For that, to that point, knowing that you, someone's going to be sitting there in these seats right. looking at it that size, you don't really, I mean, of course, you could crop if you wanted to. So the fact that we, we weren't was just, just, you know, just This cool. proves you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Greg and Mary and Denis, for an amazing conversation. Uh, please, everyone, you know, just make sure you spread the word about Dune on social media because, I mean, this is a, this is a masterpiece film. Everyone needs to see it. You're very generous. Thank you, my friend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.